that was required in design because the AMU had to survive the boost elements of the Gemini and Titan combination, and therefore it had to stay intact during these environmental conditions and then be usable. Uh, that's the reason the springs are as tight as they are. Mm -hmm. Now, about this uh, fogging, I suppose, too, it would have been a problem. Uh, there are uh, a number of lights and uh, gauges here on the chest pack that's part of the uh, unit uh, that uh, would indicate when there is a malfunction. Uh, I suppose it would make it difficult to see these warning lights. Yes. It, I think it's like uh, Walter was saying a while ago. Your windshield of your car gets fogged over. It's very difficult to see out. And these are very important for the astronaut to observe. The, he wants to know if he's got oxygen or if he's got trouble back there. The original intent of design was so that the astronaut could survey his condition and make decisions. Mm-hmm. Walter? This is the way uh, this thing would have looked uh, if uh, Cernan had uh, gotten it uh, on his back and uh, actually gotten out of the adapter and used it in space. Uh, he actually sits on a little saddle uh, on this big, uh, this big pack. He's got uh, control jets uh, that uh, there and back here that would give him complete maneuverability in space. A much more sophisticated, a much more complicated device than the handheld maneuvering unit that Ed White used. Uh, it's really not known whether that much of a device is going to be needed in space, but they wanted to test it, and they're planning on testing this uh, on this and one other of the uh, Gemini, uh, remaining three Gemini flights. This uh, large unit is a self, totally self-contained unit. The astronaut uh, has no dependence upon the spacecraft at all when he's using this AMU. Now the problem is that the AMU is still affixed to the adapter section back there in the spacecraft, and they are going to uh, uh, separate from that AMU and try to jettison it. And that is a separation is triggered by the command pilot, uh, Tom Stafford, by the press of a button and uh, a guillotine-like effect, a uh, sharp knife, uh, actually cuts this loose and uh, the unit, uh, if, if the astronaut were in it, uh, would then uh, come on out. Uh, he'd, he'd maneuver it out uh, beyond the adapter. Since there's no man to do that, uh, in this case, uh, they'll cut it loose and then since in this uh, freedom of uh, space, it would not uh, actually move, it would just continue to move along with the uh, spacecraft floating there, uh, Stafford will uh, move the spacecraft out a bit, and presumably this then remains steady, and they'll separate in that fashion, the MU float free. The adapter section itself is jettisoned just before retrofire, and that is supposed to come now tomorrow morning. The remaining uh, oh, 20 hours or so of this flight, uh, the astronauts probably will have very little to do. They've completed nearly all of their experiments, and uh, they will uh, just have a day in space uh, of observation and rest. Here's an announcement from Paul Haney. Pressurization cycle at last reading. The pressure in the cabinet built up to 3.13. They will continue to build now until something over five pounds. Uh, Stafford just noted they're up to four pounds. Uh, during the ingress procedure, uh, Cernan reported that his visor again became completely fogged. We have no... Uh, sound explanation for this. A guess or two coming from one of our staff support rooms in the back is perhaps that the uh, suit did not take enough moisture out in view of all of Cernan's activities. Perhaps the suit uh, failed to take away enough of the moisture, which uh, is one guess at uh, what could cause the fogging. Stafford uh, gave a quick summary on the EVA exercise by simply saying, I think we've learned a lot. We have this conversation, we'll play it for you now.
power transmission uh, coming there from the Rosenaut Victor out in the Atlantic as the spacecraft uh, whirls around now, sealed again, the pressure building up, uh, building very rapidly, and undoubtedly by this time, since those transmissions are delayed 15 seconds to a minute, the pressurization has been completed, and uh, the, the astronauts can depressurize the spacesuits. Uh, at that, that time, uh, uh, Cernan can uh, lift his visor, and uh, he will have full visibility again without that fog visor problem. Presumably, uh, they will have worked it out when he needs the visor down again, or prefers to have it down just for a double safety uh, in 24 hours from now when they return to Earth. CBS News coverage of the Gemini 9 mission will continue in a moment. I like it. I really do like farm olive now. They've added lime on They say it's mild and it is, and they say it flies than it does. It really lasts. Watch, we turn on warm water to test another leading beauty in bath soap against new palm olive. Eleven minutes later, look, the other soap melted through, but not palm olive. New palm olive with lanolin, one mild soap that really lasts. The women of Chester didn't believe it. They said they had a laundry detergent that really cleans in cold water. But we had to prove it ourselves. And? We did. And now we don't worry about hot water setting stains or shrinking clothes. Mrs. Marquardt is one of the many women who tested cold power. It's a new heavy-duty powder specially formulated to work in cold water. It gets out the worst kind of dirt. Get cold power. It works. Well, for a quick recap now of uh, this morning's exciting activities as Eugene Cernan, 32-year-old lieutenant commander, father of one, uh, former test pilot, made man's third walk in space and the longest by far yet. He stepped out of that Gemini 9 spacecraft over uh, uh, Hawaii, uh, between Hawaii and the United States at 12.05, uh, 11.05 uh, uh, Eastern Daylight Time, and uh, on that 25-foot umbilical cord which connected him with the spacecraft environment control system, that is the oxygen and the communications line back to Tom Stafford. He floated out, no maneuvering unit of any kind, but just on the end of the umbilical, floating free, some 25 feet from the spacecraft. Uh, he, uh, he tried the dynamics of the uh, tether, that is, uh, when he pulled on it, did the spacecraft move, did he move, and that sort of thing. They got a lot of good data there. He worked in space. He recovered an S-12 micrometeorite uh, experiment. Uh, that was finding out just how much impact and how many micrometeorites there are 185 miles high where all of this took place. He fixed a camera that would take pictures of his spacewalk. He went forward and placed a mirror on the forward part of the spacecraft so that Stafford could see him when he went to the back of the spacecraft. And then as the night approached after the first day side passed, he uh, went to, to the back of the spacecraft and got into the adapter section, that 10 foot in diameter section at the rear of the spacecraft. There to don this million dollar astronaut maneuvering unit which would have made him in effect an independent spacecraft flying alongside of the spacecraft he had left attached only by 125 foot nylon line but there was trouble with the AMU it turned out to be four to five times as difficult for him to get the arms distended the communications in the AMU unit were very seriously garbled uh, he couldn't have uh, Safford said it sounded like a loud gargle, and then there was the prime problem, and maybe one of the problems in the difficulty getting the arm extended, was that Cernan's uh, visor fogged up, like sitting in your automobile when all of the windshields fog up. Well, that's what he had with that visor and could not see. In view of all that, they canceled the mission with the astronaut maneuvering unit, and uh, Cernan returned uh, to the spacecraft. He was locked in there some 15 minutes ago after a two-hour spacewalk instead of the two-and-a-half-hour spacewalk. Uh, a disappointment for the mission uh, Gemini 9, but uh, at least they have accomplished a great deal. Nelson Benton down at uh, Mission Control in Houston can perhaps tell us what the remaining plans are for the next 24 hours of Gemini 9. Nelson? Uh, Walter, we have no indication as yet that the flight will be brought down early. Uh, the flight plan is to just normal experiments after today's EVA activity. We might note that the AMU, as NASA is currently planning, is planned for use again on the flight of Gemini 12. 
uh, on flight of Gemini 10, the next one coming up, coming up, the backpack that Dave Scott never got to use on the 8th flight is planned to be used. We might speculate that uh, things may be revised and AMU may get another chance uh, on the next flight. Waller? The CBS News coverage of the Gemini 9 mission will continue in a moment. Last season, only two crew members of the Jolie Madame smoked Alan M's, Reed Ruggles and Jane Price. This year, Tom and skipper Jack Price are on the Alan M side. When you've got today's best taste in smoking, people find out. Come on over to the Alan M side. Come on over for the taste of it. Come on over, you'll be glad you did. Come on over to the Alan M side. What makes l and today's best taste in smoking? Maybe it's the rich flavor leaf. Maybe it's the full-bodied blend. Why not ask an l and smoker? He's found out. Come on over, you'll be glad you did. Come on over to the l and side. A couple of years ago at Pete Taylor's dance studio, only Jack smoked l and Now Kim Kelly's come over. When you've got today's best taste in smoking, people find out. Well, back here at our CBS News Space Center at the McDonnell Aircraft Plant where they build these Gemini uh, spacecraft uh, in St. Louis, we have been reporting this morning on this exciting two-hour spacewalk of Eugene Cernan's. The communications were quite bad during most of that flight. What you were hearing was the, uh, the interception of the communication between Cernan outside the spacecraft and Command Pilot Tom Stafford inside the spacecraft as picked up by the various tracking stations around the world relayed by the tracking network uh, to uh, Houston and then uh, relayed to us. Uh, and apparently Houston was able to make out a little bit more of that conversation than we who were listening in could. And uh, we've got, though, a record from Houston of the most intelligible and interesting parts of that conversation. Maybe we could just read a couple of them to you now because they were quite fascinating. Cernan's very first words, as soon as the hatch opened and he stuck his head out, he said, gee, it's wild out here. I have one foot out and I'm going to try to get the S-12 now. That's the experiment with the micromedia rights. And then uh, a little later, we heard him say, or they heard him in Houston clearly say, pull me down, pull me down some more. Uh, that was either, uh, that was a word to Stafford, either to pull him down by the umbilical cord or to pull him down with his feet. I don't know whether he was already outside the spacecraft at that time or not. He said, uh, I'm very comfortable at one point. Again, he noted, it's a strange world out here, you know it. And then uh, he said he was getting around all right. It's hard to get at these things, he noted at one time when he was trying to reach the handrail. He said, I don't see anything waving off the adapter here. And that was a reference uh, when he's looking aft uh, on the spaceship uh, to the uh, lines that have been found in other spacecraft in the past. He said, it's woo, it's beautiful up here as he passed over California. Uh, beautiful spacecraft as he floated out a little way. He said he saw Edwards Air Force Base quite clearly. And there are the islands. There's Bob. California, he said. Uh, then he noticed a tendency to float upward uh, from the spacecraft, which had been noted by Ed White and Leonov before him. Uh, then he got back to the adapter, and then it got to be all work uh, and no play with the problem of getting into that AMU, which uh, he was unable to do, and with his, uh, with his uh, visor fogging up, uh, there was a lot of problem, and he had to come back without using the automatic maneuvering unit. CBS News, of course, will be standing by for further space alerts as developments warrant uh, leading up to this uh, splashdown scheduled for 10.06 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News Space Center in St. Louis.